Hello, and welcome back. This is the series in which we visit the Nowhere Place, or that figurative realm where people go when they go missing. To learn why I've named it that, make sure to watch the first episode in the series. Of course, we look from our world through the veil into the Nowhere Place, seeking those we've lost, trying to find them. But the Nowhere Place looks back, and these two are interesting stories. That is, people who may never have existed at all. Names with no faces, faces with no names. Their identities are the mystery. They were born in the nowhere place and crossed over into our records. As always, I'll alternate between the two types. Welcome to Nothing is Revealed. The entertainment industry is rife with these stories. From video games to music and film, it's collaborative art. Famous creators vanish from the spotlight and it's felt by their fans. On the other side of the coin, you have names and credits on books of people who don't exist. But somebody created it, right? Can we uncover their true identities and pull them from the nowhere place? The story of Terrence Woods terrifies me because his disappearance was so quick and there were eyewitnesses. It's like he literally vanished. Woods was a television producer. He cut his teeth over in the UK, working on high profile shows that took him all over the world. He briefly worked as a researcher at the production company Raw TV. From there, he climbed to a contractor role as a production assistant on Raw's most lucrative series. Gold Rush. Specifically, this was a spin-off, Dave Turin's Lost Mine, investigating gold mines in U.S. states from Arizona to Montana. On one particular shoot in Idaho in the Oro Grande area, Woods took a photo of the beautiful American West. He posted it on his private Instagram. According to eyewitnesses, what happened next shocked everyone on the production. Woods dropped his radio and dashed down a steep cliff, vanishing into the forest at the bottom. That was in 2018. He hasn't been seen since. Police mounted a seven-day search of the area, on foot, in helicopters. Dogs seemed to pick up the scent on the off-road at the base of the cliff, but nothing more was ever found. According to some testimony, including the 911 call that day, Woods had suffered a nervous breakdown that morning. Rumors circulated among the crew of Woods' fraying mental state. However, Woods' parents were not satisfied with this explanation. He'd never had mental health issues, they maintain. Frustrated with the lack of answers and closure, they've even alleged foul play from the crew or Raw TV as a whole. Without more evidence, I don't like to speculate on this kind of thing. Conspiring only hurts those involved. It could give false hope or undue anger. Instead, let's hit upon another facet of the story. 76-year-old Connie Johnson. She went missing the same day, miles apart. Idaho County is 8,500 miles, mostly national forest. People go missing there all the time. Just six months ago from recording, 73-year-old hiker David Wolf did as well. In September of 2010, 39-year-old Todd Hofflander went missing, and his remains were found 10 years later. As of last year, 29 cases of missing people in the U.S. national parks are considered cold. You can read about them or submit a tip in the link below. Some estimate that as many as 1,600 people have gone missing on public U.S. land. Point is, people go missing in the pristine wild often. It's as if the damp and dark loam is dotted with portals to the nowhere place. What called out to Terrence on that day? I wonder if we'll ever know. On the other side, what about the entertainment produced by ghosts? That is, people we know existed, maybe we have a photo or a pseudonym, but have never been tethered to a known person. Example, it's the summer of 1991. You're watching professional wrestling broadcast locally out of Memphis. 
Bill Dundee is facing a newcomer, the enigmatic Tagar, Lord of the Volcano. Those who have crossed me have had their bodies broken and their blood spilled. Never. These sights and sounds are seared into your mind. You watch him over the next few weeks, then he's gone. You move on and never learn who the masked Tagar was. Years later, on niche message boards and YouTube comments, people speculate. To this day, no one knows. Tagar isn't missing if we don't even know who to look for. Big shout out to Duke Warm for the suggestion and look out for a future video on this case. In the same vein, let's go back to 1996. You've got your Doritos, your pizza, your friends are sleeping over. You huddle around the green glow of a television and you pop this into your PlayStation. The beginning of a horror juggernaut. But before you get to play, you watch a live action cutscene. The scenes, filmed with real actors, bookend the game. It's cheesy by today's standards, but this was new and exciting then. When it's over and the credits roll, only the first names are listed for the actors. So who were they? Believe it or not, no one knew for years. Resident Evil is made by Capcom in Japan, so their pool of non-Japanese actors was smaller, and these people might not have had ties to Hollywood or other credits. It wasn't until 2017 that we learned of a few fans' quest. Users Fred Durf, Dr. Raichi, and Talonide, as well as others in the fan community, had been on the hunt for years. Well, 20 years later, some of the identities were revealed, along with interviews about the actor's experiences working in Japan. Charlie Kroslavsky, who played Chris Redfield, recounted how excited he was to be cast. He didn't even see the footage until years later online. Back then, smaller productions just didn't cut VHS tapes for everyone to see the finished product. It was a fun shoot with cool costumes and high spirits. The stylist dyed Charlie's hair with straight peroxide, turning it almost reddish, and so they had him shave his mismatched beard. They shot in an abandoned warehouse with a bad insect problem. Charlie was directed to, with his own fingers, pry his eye open wider to appear more frightened. To this day, four of six actors have been identified and interviewed. Charlie, Greg, Eric, and Linda. That leaves only Jason and the enigmatic Inez. In July of 2020, Dr. Raichi tweeted that at long last, Inez had been found. An interview would be going up on the blog soon. That interview still hasn't been posted, but I await with bated breath. Hey. Stop. 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 Stay. I want to show you Andromeda. Oh, wonderful. Big thanks to this user for the suggestion, and I salute the fans who've pulled these brave soldiers back to our written record. For the next two stories, tragedy. Something to which the Nowhere Place is indelibly linked. People go missing in a tragedy, and it's a tragedy when people go missing. In the province of Cuenca, Spain, in 1910, there lived a man named Jose Grimaldos. He was a 28-year-old shepherd known for being intellectually slow. That year, Grimaldos sold some of his own sheep, and shortly after, he vanished. As weeks passed and still he didn't reappear, rumors swirled about the village. Surely someone had murdered him for his sheep money. Grimaldo's family knew he was often bullied, and so they accused two of these bullies, Leon Sanchez and Gregorio Valero, of murder. A year later, and though Grimaldo's was still missing, authorities dropped the case against the two bullies. There just wasn't evidence. More years passed. In 1913, at the insistence of the family, the case was reopened. This time, Sanchez and Valero were brutally tortured. They confessed and spent four years in jail before finally getting a trial. The trial was a farce, riddled with contradictions, and still the men were sentenced. 18 more years in prison, just narrowly missing the garage. The jury only needed 30 minutes to convict. In 1925, having served their full terms, the men were released. In 1926, Jose Grimaldo's reappeared. 
He was getting married in another town just a hundred miles away and needed his baptism certificate. The townspeople were stunned to see him. The Spanish Supreme Court went on to nullify the two men's convictions, as well as compensate them for their suffering. According to the Minister of Justice at the time, there were reasonable grounds to assume the confessions were extracted under exceptional, continuous violence. The two men spent the rest of their days in Madrid, far away from the town that condemned them. On September 11, 2001, two hijacked planes were flown into the north and south towers of the World Trade Center. It's still the deadliest terror attack in history with nearly 3,000 fatalities and thousands more injured. If you were a New Yorker on that day, you might have lost a loved one, maybe several. Maybe you escaped death yourself or were horribly injured and you were left with nothing but a knot in your heart of fear and loss. You just couldn't untangle it as the years passed and mourning turned to trauma. Then a group is formed for you by those in the same shoes. The World Trade Center Survivors Network, an online support group, wants to help. Three years after 9-11, this group's founder, Gary Bogax, heard through the grapevine of another support group, run by a woman named Tanya Head. He gets in touch, they end up merging the groups, and Tanya becomes president a famous face of the survivors. She's interviewed in the media, photographed with politicians, invited to speak at conferences, and even gives tours at the Tribute Visitor Center. I was flying through the air. That's, that's what I was doing from the impact. During these appearances, she tells her harrowing story, that her husband died in the North Tower, that she'd been rescued by Wells Crowther, the heroic volunteer firefighter who lost his life. But not without serious injury, and Tanya had the marks and scars to prove it. I was smelling my own skin burning. She... The only problem, Tanya Head wasn't a real person. Meet Alicia Estevez Head. She's not even an American citizen. Head was born in Spain, and that's where she was on 9-11, studying for her master's at a private university in Barcelona. It had all been a fabrication. The husbands, the injury, the story. How was she busted? In 2007, the New York Times was running a memorial piece and just wanted to confirm known details. I'm sure they didn't expect this, that Harvard and Stanford had no record of Tanya attending, that Merrill Lynch, the company she worked for in the South Tower, had no record of her employment, that named husband Dave was a real victim, but his family had never heard of Tanya, her badly scarred arm, that came from a car accident. Head backed out of three interviews, and the Times sounded the alarms. The Survivors Network removed her from the presidency. She then quickly fled the U.S. In 2008, months later, an anonymous Spanish email account wrote to the Survivors Network with sad news. Alicia Tanya Head had committed suicide. Which was another huge lie, of course. Head and her mother were spotted in New York three years later. In 2012, a documentary expose brought the case to the public's attention. Head's employers in Barcelona saw it and fired her. Alicia and Tanya, two nearly identical people from opposite sides of the door. As always, I'll sign off with warnings. That is, stories that defy your expectations about missing and made-up people. In February of 2008, Shannon Matthews was reported missing. She was only nine years old. The search for her in West Yorkshire, England became a massive undertaking. It involved 300 officers who questioned 1,500 drivers, visited 3,000 homes. There were even 16 victim recovery canines. The media frenzy had begun too. Shannon's mother, Karen, appeared in interviews. Her terrified 999 call was released. Even as she was probed with questions over the case and the suspect men she'd allowed in Shannon's life, she had the public's sympathy. The Independent reported that because the family was poor and Karen had had many children by different men, 
The scrutiny was cruel and unusual. The culture war worked. At least 55,000 pounds were offered in reward from newspapers and businesses. Days turned to weeks. The situation looked bleak, but then a breakthrough. 24 days later, at the flat of a man named Michael Donovan, Shannon was found, alive. She'd been concealed under a bed. Case closed, right? It turned out Donovan was known to the family. He was the uncle of Mother Karen's current boyfriend. A betrayal to kidnap a loved one, no? Donovan even attempted suicide while in custody. So the world thought, until Karen's boyfriend was arrested as well. And then Karen herself, as well as other members of the family. Turned out the whole thing was planned. First, they drug her daughter Shannon. Then he'd kidnap her, eventually find her, and they'd split the reward money. They were charged with kidnapping, false imprisonment, and perverting the course of justice. They got eight years in prison each, and Shannon was placed with a foster family. The lesson? The nowhere place is not a weapon to be wielded. I've saved the creepiest for last, so strap in. A year ago, a fan named Sam emailed me with a story. Sam followed the lead singer of his favorite band on Twitter, a man called Jonathan Higgs. Jonathan is known for memeing as well as finding bizarre tweets and highlighting them. In February of 2020, he tweeted this response to this account. It's called Selfie VIPs. Only 400 followers. It features this scraggly bearded guy taking selfies with celebs. Only not comfortable selfies. They look pained, unnatural. Many don't look real, like they must be photoshopped, right? Thank you. I would fuck Thank you. The account itself is nonsense, all hashtags of random popular terms. The tweets sometimes have a brief description in Italian, but are mostly just search terms as well. This picture of guitarist Brian May has nothing to do with CNN or Biden. So why is this nowhere place? Well, at first I wasn't sure if this was a real person. It seemed like a digital creation. I mentioned the images looked fake, but the gibberish tags? The fact that the same picture is posted dozens of times in a single day and has been for years. The fact that the account then tweets other pictures of the celebrities in the replies. As if to fool search engines and tie his selfies to the celebrity? I mean, this account has been around for 10 years and has over 5,000 of these tweets. Twitter also lets you see what other tweets an account has liked. Again, this one is strange. In all that time, in all that tweeting, this account has only liked nine other tweets. And two of them are his own. For a regular human user, that's just impossible. The guy follows 5,000 accounts and never interacts with any of them. And by the way, what a random 5,000 they are. I was convinced this can't be real until I got back in touch with Sam, who figured out the guy's name, Enrico Siandri. He found an article about Enrico from some Italian website. It details how Enrico has built up his reputation by searching out famous people unknowing victims, and basically mobbing them with his smartphone. The article features his Ron Howard and Tom Hanks selfies, which, by the way, still get tweeted over and over every day. Did I mention the article was from 2015? I also found Enrico's Instagram and YouTube channel, and even his daily motion account. They all have his short, strange videos, but not spammed every day with gibberish tags. And that's it. All search engines turn up are the strange videos all over the web and references to that same article. Is Enrico Siandri a real person? He must be, right? 
He's got a name and a face. But if he was so interested in publicity, why all the cryptic and strange tweets? Why not have a website or write in his own words or blog or do interviews or sell merch? Why not appear to the world in any way at all other than this horror show? I'm still not convinced these aren't terrifying applications of deep fake algorithms. I'd love to hear your theories in the comments. Hi nerds, and thanks so much for watching. Do you have a Nowhere Place story of your own? Send me an email, and it might make it into a future episode. Big shout out to Joe Hunter for the thumbnails, and to the patrons. Dunspan, Rose, SWman3, Regina, Darks, B. Wade, Ben Cushing, Gillian Zermer, Dominic Morrow, Laura Liu, John Michael, and I almost forgot new patron, the captain of tomorrow, Patrick B. Thank you, patrons. As always, I'm glad you're here.